some, uh, some uh, terrific points there, Alan. Uh, I, I can outdo you, though. I'm going to be a granny this year, so... Uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for that. That wasn't my husband that said that. I'll tell you. Anyway, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting... I, I think the quote that was tweeted out from uh, Jim Sellers, actually, about... It hadn't actually struck me, and it, it, and it did make me very tearful, that on September the 18th, for that whole day as we are voting, we will be a sovereign nation. And actually, the thought of at a minute past 10, we may have voted to give that power away. David Gregg actually said a thing to me the other day about a, a Dutch friend of his who uh, was living here and working here and uh, had said he would be voting no and he would certainly leave Scotland if we became independent. And he said, so, why, well, you would go back to Holland? And he said, yeah. He said, so, so you would be fine with Holland having given all your revenue and all the laws and everything being made by Germany? And he sort of went, eh? Hadn't even thought about it that way because he had seen the UK as this one country. There's another point you made about Alex Hammond, actually, which, I, uh, you know, uh, I did another meeting a few months ago with Alec Neil, and somebody had said that Alex Hammond was the best leader the Labour Party had never had, which is... <laughs> and I do have to say that uh, when they go on and the, the demonisation of Alec... I mean, that's the thing. I shout at the telly when they see all this stuff about Alec, particularly the London news, about Alex Hammond. Uh, is, uh, it's as if he's this Sven Galli who's standing in Holyrood going... You will think this way. <laughs> and it's only him. It's just him and his own is doing it. There's nobody else. There's no movement there behind him. And if all he was truly interested in was his own personal power, in the Scotland that he grew up in, he wouldn't have joined a fringe party like the SNP. He would have joined the Labour Party. And he would have been Prime Minister before Gordon Brown. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, we have, uh, you know, we need women to be engaged and involved very much in this campaign. And we are uh, privileged indeed to have this woman here, Jean Freeman, who is a, a fantastic speaker, great campaigner, um, has been, uh, I wouldn't say, around the block's not the right phrase to use there, Jean, but <laughs> <laughs> like myself. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, fervent political campaigner, that's what I'll say. Please give it up for the fabulous Jean Freeman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is on. Is that better? Oh my God, I'm going to swallow the thing. <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to hold it because I can't, my glasses aren't that good. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, everybody. Sorry for that wee hiccup. It was a kind of meeting equivalent of an icebreaker. Um, thanks very much, Elaine. Uh, I was, I do intend to tell a wee bit of a personal story, but it won't cover all my stops as I went around the block. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you very much, Alan, for inviting me. I want to tell you a wee bit about why from a long, long, long family tradition in the labor movement that I um, worked in and uh, consider myself still to be part of, um, I now support independence. And I want to talk a wee bit about what it is that has brought me to this point. I grew up in Ayr um, many years ago, the daughter of a panel beater and a nurse the granddaughter of a man who was a miner in Gloucestershire who went on the hunger marches. And in all those years as I grew up, I was immersed in the notion that we look after ourselves, that the labor movement was our best bet, that that is where we went for justice, for help, for support, that trade unions mattered more actually for my father than the Labour Party did. And I grew up with three really strong messages in the heads of myself and my two brothers. And that was that what we had to be when we became adults were people who worked hard, who took responsibility, but who looked out for and helped other people. And with that at my back, I became a nurse. And with an education system at my back at that time, so this undoubtedly does date me, that not only ensured that my college or university fees would be paid, but that 
unbelievably imagined thing to young people in this audience tonight that I would be given a grant to pay my living expenses. With that at my back, I went from nursing and followed a degree. If I was a young person now, and if I was fortunate enough to have my parents still alive, those choices would not be open to me today. We could not afford to have done that. It would never have entered my brain that that was an option. But that education, those choices, reinforced for me that it was possible, no matter where you were born, no matter how you were brought up, no matter the circumstances of your birth, that the idea of opportunity for all was one to cherish, to hold, and to advance. With that in my head, I spent four years as a senior political advisor to Jack McConnell. And in that time, two things happened that reminded me of what we can achieve when we have power at our own hand through our own parliament, and also showed me really starkly what we can't do when we don't have all the powers that we need. Lots of things, but I'll pick out two examples. I saw how in our own parliament, not that many miles away, for which I and many people in this room campaigned to have, I saw how we could make a difference in health and education and injustice. I saw how we could follow a path that was closer to what people in Scotland wanted. I saw how we could try to have more teachers in our schools, to improve the quality of our health care. And in recent years, I have seen very starkly that we drive down a different road in health and education and justice than the road that is traveled south of the border. We still do have a national health service in Scotland that is there at the point of need that will, for as long as it is in our power, remain at the point of need. But we only have that because we have the power to make those decisions at our own hand. If we did not have our own parliament, we would have the kind of National Health Service that people have to suffer south of the border, which is rapidly being privatized, where management and commissioners and profit rule above all else, and where quality and health care and lower infection and higher survival rates are not what counts, but what counts is, can you make the books balance? That's the kind of health system that they have south of the border that we do not have because we have our own parliament. But I also saw in those four years what we didn't do, not only because we didn't have the powers, but because we were thrilled to a party that was a UK party, and I'll give you one example. We did not end the detention of children in Dungavel, held there only because they were the children of people who had sought asylum in our country and been turned away. We did not end that as a government, despite the community campaigns, despite the church campaigns, despite citizens the length and breadth of the country saying to us, this is not how we treat children, no matter where they come from. We knew that. We believed this is not how we treat children, no matter where they come from. Why did we not end it? Because we were thrilled to a party that was a UK party. The UK bit of it was running the government out of Westminster, and God forbid that we would ever embarrass them. Embarrassment stopped us from doing the right thing being part of a party that cared more about what happened at Westminster than what happened in Dungavel to children on our shores stopped us from doing the right thing. That taught me a powerful lesson, a powerful, powerful lesson. And the lesson was this, that actually being true to what we believe is the right thing to do matters more than any allegiance to any political party. <laughs>
political parties exist because we come together with shared beliefs and ideals and we want to organize together in order to achieve something. They are the means to the end. They are not the end in themselves. And it's time more and more and more members of the Labour Party told their party precisely that. You are not the end in itself. You are the means. And if you don't represent us, then we will have to do something different than owe our allegiance to you. It is time for us to recognize that the power to change our country is on offer to us on September the 18th. And I've had people say to me, but why, why do you need more? You run education, you run health, you run justice, you do bits and pieces around transport. What more do you need? Let me give you an example in education. We can have the best organized, resourced, value-led school education system that we could ever devise. And if a child goes to that school hungry, it won't matter a damn. If a child goes to that school knowing that their parents are worrying about stuff, knowing that their house is too small, knowing that their granny maybe has to move because somebody said she's got a bedroom too many, nothing, no education system. <laughs> no education system will work for that child as that child deserves it to work for him or her. So we need to have the power to deal with this in the round. We need to be able to have a welfare system that is a safety net, that does help and support and nurture. We need to have economic powers to create an economic strategy and policies for Scotland that are for Scotland, not for the southeast of England, that are driven by our values and our needs, that encourage enterprise, that encourage economic growth, but are bound round by policies that say, above all else, there will be fairness in how we handle the wealth of this country and how we use it for every citizen. My mom and dad taught me that I had to stand on my own two feet, I had to work hard, and I had to be responsible. But they also taught me that no matter how much I did that, my life would not be as rich as it could be if I didn't care about what was happening to the person next to me if I didn't try and make sure that they had the same opportunities as I had, that they had the same chances, and that they had the same encouragement. We know that to be true. It is time we said so. It is time we articulated exactly what are our values as a country. With independence, with all of those powers, with the opportunity of a written constitution, there is our chance. There is our chance for us, each and every one of us, no matter our background, no matter our job, no matter our um, aspiration, to come together and have lots of brilliant arguments about what will be in that constitution. What an opportunity that is. How exciting is that? There are three main reasons why we should have independence. There is a democratic reason. For over 42 years, I've been able to vote in a UK general election. Only twice have I got the government that I and the majority of people of Scotland voted for. That's not democracy. That isn't going with the grain of what we are and who we are and what we want. The second reason is prosperity. Alan mentioned it, others undoubtedly will. We are rich not just in natural resources, but in the talent of our people, everyone in this room. You are talented, you are able, you have intellect, you have energy. Multiply that to the five million of us that there are and think of that resource and how much we do not harness that and how much we could. And there is fairness. It's not just about what we could achieve, how prosperous we could be. It's about the kind of country we want to live in. What kind of values do we want to see enshrined in that constitution? What kind of rights do we want to have? And I'll tell you now, as a woman, I am tired of arguing for it, asking for it, 
playing nicely for it. I want equality in that constitution, first and last. So the vote on September the 18th is about choice. And it's about choice of thinking, just close your eyes for a minute and think of the one thing you can think of that would make Scotland a better country for you to live in, your family, your children and your grandchildren. Just one thing. And then tell me if you think you're going to get that from Westminster under any stripe. That is why we want independence. That one thing that imagining a better Scotland and knowing with the powers at our own hand we could choose, we could make it that way. Independence and voting for independence is about voting for ourselves, our own belief in ourselves and the choice to make of our country all that it can be. It's not about party allegiance, it's not about party politics, it's about choosing. Where do you think the best bet lies? For me, the best bet is us. It always will be, and it is right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you very much. I'm sure... Uh